come together. Father, I thank you that again we can come and meet with each other. But Father, for those at home, we thank you that your spirit will be just as prevalent to them at home as it is with us today. Mm -hmm. And 
Father, as Richard brings your word, Lord, I thank you that your anointing will be on him later on. Amen. As John, come to the reading. So uh, today's reading uh, is 1 John, chapter 2, and verse 3 to 11. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims I know God, but does not obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. This is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one that you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before, yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves another brother or sister is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates another brother or sister, is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your. sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen.
Bless the Lord, Lord of oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Have I put the mic on properly? I've broken something. I think a bit of fluff has come off the mouthpiece. Sorry about that. I'm going to start, uh, or rather continue our series, but uh, looking at a new tack. We're carrying on with um, John's letter to the early church, as you can see, and now we're going to move on to um, a subject I'm calling in characteristics of a true believer. And my question is, how can we be sure if we really know God? How can you be sure if you know God? What characteristics should be the biggest giveaways? I'm sure everybody here who professes to be a believer has heard the retort, call yourself a Christian. Yeah, I have on quite a few occasions, especially when someone has got a different view to me. Someone decides that their definition of what a Christian should be, even though they may not be one, is what should define how I should be. I remember having a very lively discussion with a friend of mine at dinner. It's so long ago, I can't remember what the, what the conversation was about, but I had that question aimed at me, call yourself a Christian. And I remember my answer, even though I can't remember the subject, was, what's a Christian? And uh, it actually then stemmed a, a really interesting conversation, because it is a good question. What is a Christian. And I think there are lots of things that don't define what a Christian is. A Christian isn't perfect, for example, contrary to what some might uh, think makes someone a Christian. Now, so far this, uh, this year, we've been looking at John's letter to the early church, and we've been reminded of some essential truths, such as Jesus being the, the visible image of the invisible God. The deity of Christ is not difficult to prove when you look at Scripture. And we've learned how we need Jesus as our Savior. We can't save ourselves. We can't make ourselves good enough for God. We can't justify ourselves before God. We need a Savior who can rescue us from the consequences of our wrongdoing and the distance we put between ourselves and God because of the way that we live our lives. We all need forgiveness. And that's why making comparisons with other people is a waste of time. And we looked at some extreme examples that we wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable with being compared to and told that we share the same destiny as they do unless our sin is dealt with just like theirs. We don't like that. But we learned and we were reminded that making comparisons are a waste of time because we all fall short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat, you might say. And Jesus calls believers to follow him. As we look at the gospel, it's, it's, it's riddled with calls to follow, to move from darkness into his light. And as a consequence of that, knowing him results in change. It does matter how we live our lives if we profess to live in his light. But praise God, it's not down to us. He empowers us to change, to walk in that light. It's a, you know, I didn't have a Paul on the road to Damascus kind of experience. My, my change has been gradual. Paul, who calls himself the chief of sinners because he used to go about killing Christians, had a remarkable transformation. But 
we all experience a different rate of change, you might say, in the way that that light permeates our lives and changes us. But change happens. It's a necessity. And if we're nodding our head in agreement with all of these things, the, the question is, well, what's changed? What's changed in your life? Where or, or what is the proof? Where's the evidence that we know God if we say we do? And in our reading, John writes, we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. And so if keeping the commandments is evidence of knowing God, then what are those commandments? What does he tell us to do? And if you just read through the letter that we've started, just in the very next chapter, John writes, this is his commandment. 1 John 3, 23, we must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Have you ever heard someone say, well, Christianity is just a long list of do's and don'ts? Well, to my reckoning, that is a very short list. Would you agree? I can remember this, and it dispels that idea, that notion that it's a long list of do's and don'ts. It's not. And it's interesting that we see here that the commandment is singular. This is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Can, can everything really be boiled down into a single statement like that? Yes, absolutely. To know God, we must believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came to reveal God to us. And God's command is, believe that. Believe it. And then, if you say that you believe it, the knock-on effect is that we will love one another in a way that we previously didn't and couldn't. We love in light of knowing God through his Son. And the Bible tells us that God is love. And God imparts his love to us. When we follow him, we experience that love, and it's that love that changes us. And John even reminded his readers that he was referring to something that they already knew. They'd heard this commandment from Jesus himself. Jesus was debating some religious leaders. And Mark records in chapter 12, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well. So he asked, of all the commandments which is the most important. Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So we can see here that every other requirement God has of us sits under those two headings. Loving God, loving others. And of course, if we go back to the very beginning, which we're told to do, and look at the commandments, look at the Ten Commandments, well, they're presented in exactly the same format. They address our relationship with God, and they address our relationships with other people. It's entirely consistent. And yes, it is boiled down to just that very, very short list. And if we can get this right, and as works, uh, and as works in progress, I am certainly a work in progress, I remind myself of that regularly, we don't always get it right. It does make sense. If someone really knows God, then they want to please him. They want to know more about him, and they want to follow in his ways. Maybe it starts with baby steps. Maybe it includes stumbles. It may include falls. But it's that direction of travel when we are actually going in that direction, wanting to walk in his light 
And in that process, he changes us. And it impacts what we do. It impacts how we do it. And it even broadens our obligations to love our enemies. And that's a tough one. That's why it's a process, because it doesn't come naturally. But it's evidence of a genuine faith. And Scripture doesn't duck the issues. John doesn't duck the issue. He tells us there are such things as counterfeit believers. He says, if someone claims I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. He doesn't beat about the bush, does he? We can understand what he's saying. There's the story of a very wealthy man I heard of. He had all all of the toys, the Ferrari, the super yacht. He had everything. But he wasn't renowned for being very generous. And one day he called the dentist surgery and he said, excuse me, can I have a quote for, um, for four wisdom teeth removals? And he was very shocked because they said, well, that's 400 pounds. 400 pounds? That's ridiculous. How can you justify that? Well, there's the dentist fee. There's the accommodation cost anesthetic, we've got a dental assistant to pay, there's a course of antibiotics for afterwards, and of course there's pain relief. All of this is included. Well, that's ridiculous, he said. Forget the anesthetic. Forget the dental assistant. We'll miss the antibiotics. Forget pain relief. What does that bring it down to? Well, that's 300 pounds. Should we book you in, sir? No, this is for my wife. It's just a light-hearted story, isn't it? But it's, it's got a serious point to it. He had the resources. He was able to demonstrate his care, his love and concern for his wife. We can guess he didn't have a problem loving himself. But what of others? Would he agree his understanding of love was wrong? Probably not. So why is it impossible to know God and and not keep his commandments? Because it shows our understanding of who he is. What he's like is completely wrong. Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On Judgment Day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. You see, a believer isn't someone who makes a claim. As we're learning, a believer is someone who knows God and follows his ways. And scripture tells us what or who the real deal is. Verse 5, those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. And I trust that that is everyone, everyone's experience here this morning, whether you're tuning in or in the building, through obedience, showing God, that you completely love him. And when that's your direction of travel, you can be assured that you are living in his light. Obedience to God is linked to knowing him and loving him. And of course, that then speaks of relationship, doesn't it? How do you get to know someone? You get near, don't you? You get close. You spend time with them. You ask questions, you you find out what their values are, what makes them tick, what they like, what they may not like, what makes them happy, what makes them sad. And you build up a picture over time of their character and personality. And we talk in, in our circles perhaps, or not our circles, rather generally as mankind, we talk about some people being deep, some people being shallow, some people seem to be very easy to get to know, some are difficult. But it's interesting, isn't it, how we are all different. God is fathomless, and he's perfect. 
There is no aspect of God that will not amaze you the more you get to know him. And the more you get to know him, the more there is to learn. Does that reflect how we are before God? Wanting to know, wanting to get near, finding out, building a relationship because there is an infinite God who knows you inside out. And he wants you to know him. He wants you to draw near. And how is that possible? How is that possible with a God who is infinite, all-knowing, everywhere? How can you grasp him, as it were? It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into the world from heaven in order to show us how to draw near to God. If you want to know what to do, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. If you want to know how to deal with other people, look to Jesus. I never had the wristband, but I thought it was a very good one, the WWJD wristband. Do you remember it? The What Would Jesus Do wristband. It's, it's very good because it's a bit like the Kruponol advert. It it's, does exactly what it says on the tin. We should do exactly what he did. And when we read the gospel accounts, we can see exactly what he did do. And of course, he's different. He is God in the flesh, but he is our savior. He's the one that we follow and we follow his ways. Study for yourself. How did he maintain a relationship with God the Father? I know it's a bit mind-blowing to consider how God himself became human as it were, detached himself from his glory. But that's what scripture says. He, he took on board the limitations of a body. But he did that so that we could understand how we are to relate to God the Father ourselves, that we can do that. We can pray. We can set time aside. We can retreat. Have some peace and reflection in the presence of God our Father. And what about the way he related to people, his followers, even his enemies? In John's Gospel, we read that Jesus said, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. He's not on about squatting, it's not a holiday booking. He's talking about eternity, an eternity with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And Scripture tells us that you can tell a believer by their walk. Verse 6, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. And we've touched on this before, so I won't labor on it, but we have a responsibility to live up to our profession of faith. And I was thinking, if there's a positive to be had from the instances when we fail, because fail we will, it's the fact that we're aware of it, if that makes sense. If it troubles you when you fail, that is a good thing. If it's like water off a duck's back, then I would be worried. And the Greek word used, and I don't normally labor on words being used in Greek and Hebrew because I don't speak either, but I did check these out. The Greek word, which has been translated here to describe to live in God, to live in or abide, describes a continuous action. It's not once in a lifetime thing. You, you can't, as it were, dine out on a decision you say you made at Sunday school 20 odd years ago or whatever. This is a continuous thing. And the Greek word used to describe how we should live as Jesus did describes an obligation. It, we have a duty. There is an expectation to follow Jesus' example, however stumblingly, if there's such a word. <laughs> what does this look like in real terms? Well, like I say, you need to read it yourself. I've heard it said the Bible is the most 
most-owned book and the most unread. Read the Gospels. See what Jesus did. And insofar as God enables you, as you get to know him, do the same. Mervyn calls his, his uh, sermon on a similar subject, the doobie doobie do. <laughs> what you see him do, do it. What you see him being, be it. And we see, I'll summarize, how Jesus honored God the Father in the way he lived his life. He prayed and glorified him. Jesus showed how to maintain a close relationship with God. Do the same. He sacrificed his personal comforts for the benefit of others. It gets uncomfortable, doesn't it, when we start thinking in those terms. Jesus shared the good news about how mankind could be reconciled to God. Repent. Believe. He showed compassion and care for the poor and the rich. And we see in Scripture for the rich, their wealth creates an obstacle. But wealthy people do come to faith still. He loved them all. He sought to bring healing and relief to the sick and those who were oppressed. He got alongside some difficult cases, we might call them. He even laid down his life as a sacrifice for sinners. Why? What was his motivation? We've already discovered it. Love. It was out of love that he, he did all this. God is love. It's entirely consistent to expect to see Jesus living a life full of love. And scripture tells us that we are all made in the image of God. That means you can love. You can love. And you might think, well, I've got these reasons, I've got these hurts, and I'm not belittling any tragedies that any of us have suffered in our lives, but you can love. You can especially, you will love when you come near to God through Jesus Christ, his son, it will change your life because when his love touches your heart, you, as it were, you share in that love and you can share it. So yes, we all have the capacity to love. And if, if you feel that you're cold and unable, draw near to God. Develop that relationship with him and the love that you experience will enable you to love others in a way that you never could or perhaps have done up to now. And Paul describes what this kind of love looks like in our everyday living. He says, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is, it, it is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. This kind of loving can hurt. In fact, it's inevitable if you're generous with your love. It might not be reciprocated. Love that is ignored, especially, especially this kind of love, the real kind of love. That hurts. It might be rejected. That hurts. It may even result in personal suffering because we took a risk. There are Christians who are hurting in prison because they took a risk, because they showed love but it's worth it. Why? In chapter 4 of the book we're looking at, John writes, we love each other because he loved us first. Because our motivation is loving God. So it is worth it. Because we are showing God that we love him by loving others. What I can assure everybody is that you will not experience hurt like he did. 
Jesus knows personally how loving hurts through personal experience. In the book of Romans, we read, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. I wasn't reciprocating God's love. I rejected God's love. I wasn't interested. I rebelled. I sinned. And so did you. And yet he showed his great love for us by dying for us while we were still sinners. That was the length he went to. To show his love in order that we might have a relationship with God the Father through Jesus as a consequence of his death, but also his resurrection. And with Easter on the horizon, we'll be looking at the crucifixion in more detail and all that that entailed and what it means to each one of us. But get ahead and read it. Remind yourself of the lengths he went for you. And as we draw nearer to God, through knowing Jesus, his son, he will empower us to live lives full of love. Love for him, love for one another, and even love for our enemies. Let's pray and ask that God would just touch us with his love this morning in a new way. Give us a new insight, a new experience. Knowing God isn't just head knowledge. It is an experience. Knowing a true and living God, having a relationship, has to be an experience. If you haven't experienced the love of God, ask. As I said, he had a a simple message, believe and repent. If you believe, take the opportunity to say, I'm sorry that I put myself in this position where I haven't reciprocated your love. I have rejected it, but now things are different. I want to follow you. I do believe. I do repent. And I am sorry. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that wherever we look, there is just so much truth. It is truth from start to finish. It's life-changing. It has eternal significance for each and every one of us. And thank you, Lord, but just by looking at two, a couple of simple things this morning, it proves that your burden is light, that you're not asking us to do something that is unrealistic. You want us to do what is in our best interest because you love us. Heavenly Father, I just pray that everyone here this morning, listening by whatever means, will know your love for them. Love that is like no other. Love that is pure, that is perfect. That doesn't have self-interest at the core, but has our well-being, our eternal future at the center. And as the pinnacle of your creation, Lord God, we understand that you, you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And that all you ask is that we believe and trust and follow you. That we love you. And Lord oh God, I just pray this morning that we would all experience that sense of being loved in that way by God, who loves perfectly. And Lord, we wish to reciprocate that love, to say thank you, to know you more, to understand you more, to walk in your light, to live in a way that would bring you cheer, your approval. Thank you, Lord God, that you are so gracious and kind and forgiving, that even when we don't meet the mark, because so often we don't. Like the best father or, or mother we could imagine, what a, our, our concept of parentage is, is nothing compared to how you love us as your children. You don't reject us, but you are faithful and forgiving. 
Thank you, Lord God, that your word also tells us that you remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. And so, Lord, when we say that we believe and trust in you and that we're sorry, I pray, Lord God, that each one of us would understand that that means our sins are forgiven, that we are free of them, and that in your sight we are righteous. We are right before you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Thank you, Richard. Well, if everyone would like to stand, we'll just sing one last song. <laughs> Christ, 
and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all, evermore. Amen. Amen. Thanks for